welcome everybody and thanks for taking time to come along to this session. Um, my talk or presentation is looking at the use of CAS for plant and animal breeding to select desirable population genetics and for productivity gain on farm. I'm James Price and I'm here from Concierge Genetics. Um, so, so uh, I guess a little bit of background information. Uh, as you are all aware, uh, the global population is increasing. There will be 2.3 billion more people on this earth by 2050, and 70% more food is going to be required to feed this growing population. We'll be using scarce natural resources more efficiently and adapting to climate change. Great, thank you. So molecular plant breeding is becoming increasingly valuable to productivity gains. Breeding companies are using molecular genotyping to genotype their, their populations. And there's a, going to be an increase in, in demand for bio, bioinformaticians and biostatisticians to develop better ways of analyzing megadata to improve profit. Going the wrong way. And then there'll be more R&D investment into breeder platforms. So the omics era, we're increasing throughput, accuracy, and also at a reduced cost. And there's a large push to digital agriculture and big data and how to be able to better use that in the future. As an example, that top figure shows the winter grain crops in Australia. And it's grown on approximately 23 million hectares. And the production is 59 million tonnes. So it works out to about 2.5 tonnes per hectare. And that is around 20% of the global production. Down the bottom, you can see Wheat is the most important crop, followed by the oil seeds, barley, pulses, and then the other crops come in after that. A little bit about meat consumption. Um, here you can see Australia and the United States. We're consuming roughly 90 kilograms per person. And in the, into the future, as the middle classes and the economies increase in, 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 the, in other countries, um, these people will be use, requiring more protein. So they'll be largely changing from a plant-based plant diet into a meat-based diet. And some of the challenges that are faced by breeders and in plant breeding is the fact that there are a lot of constraints and pressures, including water limitations, disease pressures, heat and soil constraints. Water is the single largest constraint, however, and as you can see by the bottom figure, the rain is cyclical and there's uh, drying that occurs around the critical stage of anthesis from booting through to grain filling. And this is where plants are setting up their yield. And okay, <laughs> setting up their yield to. Um, Just setting up the <laughs> um, One of the examples here is uh, rust resistance. Um, below are the main, oops, sorry. Below are the main rusts, leaf rust, stem rust, and stripe rust. And there's been a push to APR genes. And on on the figure uh, uh, above, you can see LR67, LR68, uh, through to LR34. These are often multi-pathogen resistant genes, so stripe rust, leaf rust, and powdery mildew. And one of the important things and for using genotyping and molecular markers is to be able to stack these genes and have more durability going forwards and longevity of varieties in the field. You could, you could see that it would be difficult to um, 
tell if, if there was only one or multiple genes in a plant. So molecular markers are uh, really beneficial in being able to pyramid these genes. A bit of a background of uh, breeding strategies. So here is a back crossing strategy where the donor parent has the marker of interest and as you go through the F1, through the back cross one, two, all the way through to where you're selfing, that segment sh is shortening where you're selecting for the genes of interest. The other important thing is knowing your breeding objectives. So you need to know the target traits that are important for varieties going forward in, and release to farmers and combining the best genetics through crossing either back crossing straight crossing or top crossing and we find the best lines with selection genotypic selection also through disease nurseries and we make sure that they are the best by wide scale yield testing before releasing that to market this is an example of a typical breeding program where you're making your crossing and at this stage this is where you're doing your marker screening of your complex F1s. Then as the population progresses you're selecting for the, the simple traits in the field, uh, agronomy and de disease resistance and pushing your population forward until you're starting to fix your lines where you're looking at your complex traits such as yield, disease and quality, and multiple years of testing over multiple environments. And finally, you release a variety plant breeders with plant breeders' rights, you know the quality and this is um, released to farmers for growing. So this is a, the breeders' funnel. Essentially what you're doing is you have a large population, you're selecting for your simple traits and then through for your complex traits and really understanding um, your variety by the time you've gone from a, a large population down to a, the, the variety that you're releasing. So one way to, to look at breeding is through the breeder's equation. So delta is the rate of genetic gain and the way to increase your rate of genetic gain is through genetic variants, having wider crosses. Um, also the population size, it's, it's, a, it's a probability game. So the, the larger your population, the more chance you have of releasing a variety at the end. And then selecting on the heritable traits through genotyping. And this is all over the generation time. So how long it takes from cross to cross or seed to seed. So speed breeding is one way to to increase the rate of genetic gain and genotyping, the focus of this talk is the other is an important way to increase the rate of genetic gain. So, genotyping allows you to accurately and precisely select for uh, traits that are important, increase your market share as you release better varieties to the to the market. So there are different ways of doing marker selection. Traditional, traditional marker assist selection would be less than 100 markers on the sample and, and these could be traits such as disease resistance, quality, uh, agronomic or phenotypic uh, phenology traits. And there's also the era of genetic genomic selection where there's multiple traits, multiple markers across um, the entire genome. So essentially what we're doing is we're translating the genotype, GCAT, into sele selection values. So for simple traits like leaf rust, LR34, or cliff field tolerance, or LR67. Below is an example of a typical uh, yield trial. And next to that image is the different genotyping methods where you have whole genome sequencing. Next to that is uh, a dense markers, which is genomic selection across the entire chromosome versus your specific traits uh, with marker assisted selection. So marker assisted breeding, there are um, multiple ways you can utilize this technology. Um, 
essentially one would be defect elimination. So an example would be to improve the quality of your lines by uh, picking the glue tenons that are important. You could select for desirable traits as well and stacking or pyramiding of disease genes. So you're improving the genetics of the entire population and, and phenotyping is often cheaper than phenotyping. But one of the most important outcomes is that you have homozygous individuals. So in any given population, you generally have a normal distribution and what you're doing is selecting, you're shifting the mean to have a positive selection in your population. However, sometimes you may have genes that are linked to deleterious um, genes as well, and you could actually be moving your population backwards. But generally, well understood, you with with the genetics of the, of the traits, you'd be pushing your entire population forward. So some of the technology changes that have occurred in breeding focus on gen on genotyping. Uh, Gel electrophoresis has been replaced with endpoint reading and CAS technology. So this is moving um, from gels down the bottom through to endpoint PCR. And this has really increased the efficiency in which you can which you can do genotyping for a breeding program. So some of the technology from LGC is the hydrocycler and Octopure. The hydrocycler allows you to do uh, a lot higher throughput in PCR and endpoint genotyping, and the Octopure allows you to do automated DNA extraction. So you'd have more data, faster and better quality. As an example, in the UA Bali program, this increased the throughput in the lab probably about tenfold. So that means that data was available when it was required in the breeding program and could genotype more, more lines. The, the, the other thing that has been happening is a huge changes in the cost of generating sequence information. So this figure here shows the drastic reduction in the cost of genotyping in, in the cost of sequencing the human genome. But only three years ago they the big they are able to produce the thousand dollar human genome, where the first human genome costs around fourteen billion. And this means that we can apply this technology to breeding as well for rapid discovery of of, of markers and we can convert this, these markers into CAS assays for high throughput breeding. So one of the examples of some recent work that, that we've conducted is in sugarcane. We've developed um, developed this with CSRO, with Meredith McNew and Sugar Research Australia, uh, Priya and, and Jenny. So we use the DNA extraction speedex kit from LGC and we had 100% ex ex extraction. So we're very happy with that result. It was high yield and purity and, and gave good quality. So we had a data point for every single, every single line that we were investigating. And what we did was develop some CASP assays from the high density axiom sniff array. And this will, will enable the breeding program to apply apply this marker in their breeding programs for high throughput uh, genotyping. And the result was that between the platforms there was a 91% concordance between the genotype calls and good clustering in the scatter plots of the, the homozygous and heterozygous type. An image for that. Another example is, sheep, is the sheep uh, genotyping. The piebald genes uh, in merino sheep uh, cause color pigmentation, or color in the wool, which results in contamination and decreased value. So there's multiple genes that, that are controlling this, the Agouti, MC1R, and TYRP1 are involved. And you can see the phenotype in the bottom, the black lamb, we want to remove those genetics from this population. So it would be useful to also make sure that we have the correct RAM 
So the, who, we want to determine who the father is, and that can be retired from breeding. So another way we could use to do this is do parentage of the rams and also the lambs that are affected. And LGC has a new new platform or new service called the Seek Snip, which enables targeted genotyping by sequencing. And also they offer the um, enzymatic DVS as well. One of the other important platforms is microsatellite SSR conversion service that LGC is offering. And there, as an example, there are many published Rust regime, Rust genes in wheat. Uh, some of them uh, still have the linked SSL markers, example of YR4. And basically what you can do is have the resistant and susceptible carrying lines and you PCR the SSR marker and then sequence this and you interrogate that sequence output for indels or SNMPs to convert to CASP. So this, could be, this is a really, really good um, service got to be used for converting from essentially a gel-based option through to a high-throughput CASP assay. So in summary, we looked at um, there's going to be an increase in global population, increase for demand for food. We had a brief overview of breeding, uh, breeding strategies, and breeding is generally a 10 year cycle. Mas marker assisted selection uh, is used for increasing the rate of genetic gain and also defect elimination. And there's been some really good technology changes in the last 10 years. So this has an an enabled labs to move from low throughput gel based systems through to high throughput CASP assays. And we had a couple examples in sheep and, and sugarcane. Some of the new services in, include the microsatellite SSR conversion and CXNIM. And all of this is focusing on improving farm productivity, so less inputs. Uh, high yields and high quality product. And with that, I'd like to thank the people that have helped in this work, uh, Sugar Research Australia, Greg Joyce and Jenny, uh, CSRO Med Meredith McNeil, UA Barley Program, GeneWorks, and LGC, Liam Piang, and the LGC team. Thanks very much for um, the opportunity to speak here. Thank you.